Hey y'all, hey. It's your girl Morgan Renee. Just tuning in with you all. Um, I want to read chapter one of No Disrespect by Sister Soldier. Yesterday I read her um, note to the readers, which was very interesting. Um, and it gave you her perspective on why she wrote this, which is similar to the conversations I like to have on my Facebook page concerning um, sex relationships and communicating. Uh, she does a great job of really delving into these different topics and different relationships in her book. And so I'm going to read the first chapter. Now, I'm the type of person I like to read the table of contents. I like to read everything. Um, and sometimes I scan to see, you know, what I'm what I'm getting myself in for. And I know some people might get discouraged if the chapter seems seems a little lengthy so i'm going to read as much as i can before i feel like i'm tired um hopefully i read the whole chapter but if i don't and i stop then i'll just do two parts to the video all my lives i'm downloading and i'm uploading it onto my youtube channel which is morgan myers it's the red heart sign excuse me not the red heart the red circle if you go on my page and you see my cover my logo the more my logo which stands for my initials morgan renee myers because you go on more of my energy entertainment some people think it's pronounced more remy it's not, but I don't get offended if they say it, but it's more of my. So um, when you type in Morgan Myers on YouTube, you'll see probably a few different channels because I got a few different YouTube accounts. Some of them got poetry and stuff on them. I got to get it all combined into one. But the one I'm using for um, my storytelling, my cooking, my crochet, my poetry and performances is more of my. Um, I'm doing amazing, Uncle Tony. Thanks for asking. So I'm about to just hop into the book, and it's very interesting. I really wish I could read the notes to the readers again, but go on my YouTube. It's up there. Um, she really explains, you know, why she decided to write like this and about African unity and black folks' inner self-hatred. It's really interesting, okay? So chapter one goes like this, Mother. In the project, somebody can call your mother a one-legged whore who does nasty tricks for men for $5, and she will still be the most important and influential person in your childhood. She is the only one a child can depend on for survival and to interpret life. She is the only one who will put together some type of dinner by any means necessary. Even for children who grow to hate their mothers, their hatred will be the strongest love they know. In the projects, rather than right being right and wrong being wrong, mama is right and whatever she says is wrong is wrong. But aren't all mothers everywhere the central figure in the eyes of a child? Mostly the answer is yes. But for the children in the projects, the answer is even more so. The difference in the extreme complication of circumstances. Excuse me. Peace, everybody. Yes. It's a, one of her older books. It ain't new. Um... The difference is the extreme complication of circumstance. The reason? Most children in the project don't have a father to speak of. In the projects, the prospects and pro excuse me, in the projects, the prospects and opportunity provided through education are almost nothing since no real effort is made to educate people properly or culturally. In the projects, the escapes and outlets created by money are eliminated because there is no intelligent finance, only haphazard consumerism. In the projects, the creativity and will to survive and to overcome horrible circumstances is usually destroyed because there are no freedom spaces where a child can go to think and expand the mind. In the projects, there are often no trees, no flowers, no understanding of agriculture, and no more than makeshift playgrounds. Y'all think on the stuff that she's saying. Saying, okay this is an autobiography so this ain't um this is non-fiction it's not fiction it's not fake it's got to do with real life of course against the eyes there are a few people who make it what about them and what is meant by making it when i do this that's because i got quotations usually they are people who manage to escape down a slim corridor of chance through the strength of their mothers mothers who were able by piecemeal work faith prayer or prostitution to control or barter their lives in exchange for the partial freedom of their babies but physically escaping the projects is not one fourth of the battle anyway it's breaking the cycles of spiritual emotional intellectual mental and cultural death that even a brief stay in the projects can mean it is struggling to understand basic concepts like who you are as an african male or female what is a family and how is it formed solidly before the penis and vagina cause reckless destruction to life and organization is that not what i talk about on my page like we need to know who and why we sex is beautiful but we need to know who we being intimate with before we do before we bring kids into this life before we start to argue about um single motherhood and why we shouldn't talk about it and down women that are doing it no we shouldn't down them but we should analyze our actions let me just read because let me stop interrupting y'all already know but this is why i'm reading it because it really touches on things that i like to speak about on my platform 
What is a family and how is it formed solidly before the penis and a vagina cause reckless destruction to life and organization? What is a thought? What is a mind? How do we teach a mind to think when so many have become comfortable with not thinking? TV. What is the relationship between your talents and skills and business? How and where do you get information when no information seems available? I think this is before Google days. And most of all, how do you not end up consciously or subconsciously a whore, literally or figuratively a whore like your mama? Now, don't be alarmed by the word whore. It can be applied to anyone who engages in an activity that they don't believe in, that they don't gain from, that don't want to participate in, feel violated by, and are forced to do by either the limitations of their own mind or the limitations of society or both in order to survive. A whore can use the mind, body, or spirit as a source of small or large income. It's great that you are reading and giving your insight to. You like it fast. Okay, boo. I just know like the chapter can get a little long and I be eating stop and be giving my I just go with the flow, okay? I just try not to stop so much. I was born in the Bronx, the second child of a mother and father's marriage. My father was a hardworking man and always had a great love for people. He was generous almost to the point of irresponsibility. After listening to any neighbor's sad story, he might find himself giving away half of his paycheck with no concern or expectation of ever getting his money back. He believed in family but resisted his own father's definition of what it should be. His father had two wives and two sets of children for his own pleasure and didn't ask anybody's permission or acceptance. My father didn't want to repeat the suffering, pain, anger, and lack of parental guidance that he grew up with. But my father drew his understanding of what it meant to have a family from television. He wanted to be a man's man. He believed that it was solely the man's responsibility to bring home the bacon and rule the household. What y'all think? Y'all think men should be the breadwinners to bring home all the money? And what y'all think? Leave your comments. Because I was caught up on that for a few years. Now I'm kind of... I don't know. I still don't know. Because I make my own money. So it's like even if a man did that, I would still be making money through my passive income streams, through the gifts that God, talents God has blessed me with, whether it be poetry, speaking engagements, theater, book writing. Like I'm going to get coins. It's just going to come to me. People love to um, bless me and I love to accept the blessings. But what y'all think? Y'all think men should make all the money and be the breadwinners? Um, he thought it was the man's responsibility to bring home the bacon uh, and rule the household. He believed that the woman must work hard at being beautiful, that she make her husband as comfortable as a king in his own castle, but, excuse me, excuse me, that she perfect her skills of house cleaning and cooking and have a lot of babies. After all, he figured, she had all day to correct any flaws in her appearance. Most of all, he demanded that she be fully dependent upon him. No driving, Traveling alone, taking classes, no need to think too hard or waste time worrying her pretty little head with survival or business, matters that were properly the province of the man. He must be the source of her money, love, sex, strength, and center of her existence. My father was six foot five inches tall, brown skin, and had a handsome baby face. What Fash say? I am unsure of whether men should be the sole provider only because there are times are quite different it's hard to survive on one income you right sis it is very difficult um these days and times you're right so i'm not opposed to i just don't want a, a lazy bum because like i said i'm gonna get mine like i'm entrepreneur minded i can't have a man that's just not now you know struggling and trying to get it together is a different story but just like not making no effort not utilizing your skills it ain't gonna work for me honey my mother was the exact personification of my father's dreams. In fact, one might think they had spent their childhoods watching the same white American television programs. She was unquestionably the most physically and facially beautiful woman in any room she entered. Her skin was rich brown, brown and flawless. Her eyes were almond shaped like mine and seductively situated. She was an excellent cook and fully prepared to serve her man. Indeed, she was an enthusiastic and willing student for my father's philosophy of dependency because she herself had been abandoned by her father, a West Indian black man. Her father had left when she was only nine months old. She He returned eight years later to get some pussy from her mother in exchange for taking the family out for a rare good restaurant meal. Now, mind you, Sister Soldier gonna keep it real, but she's gonna keep it straight. She's gonna use words like pussy. She's gonna cuss, and I'm gonna read them right along with what she's saying okay don't get offended don't take it personal after 
they all burped. He was never to be heard from again. So my mother grew up with no direction. After having been deserted, her mother had to work so hard just to survive that she had no time to share what little knowledge she had about women, men, and life. Therefore, my mother was comforted by the notion of my father wanting to fully possess her. So she fell right into place. She had three children by my father. She stayed home all day keeping house, watching soap operas, exercising with Jack LaLanne, preparing meals, and waiting for her hard-working husband to return home after conquering the world let me pause see what mama patricia got to say men should be providers you never know what will happen when you go to have that baby but you better have your own money no matter what times were hard were hard back in the day too for different reasons but the last generation that i know that prides itself in being a provider is my father's generation he's pushing 80 mm. You should, Patricia. It's it's a really good book. And by the end, I ain't going to tell you what happened. I read it years ago. But it's a really good book. Um, definitely should read it. <laughs> and I would love to have some... Uh, I'm going to write down some ideas and themes in it and have like probably some discussions on my page and also some um, sister circles around some of the things that she's saying. But I do think what she's saying is interesting. And Patricia, you've seen from some of the stuff I post, we've had some disagreements, but I'm single. I got kids. I ain't been married. Some of the stuff I just don't know. I'm going based off of the wife mentors that I follow. I'm, but my mind is, is open and it's always changing, which is why I don't need a man right now because I'm too double-minded, too open-minded. Um, so, but I'm... I'm seeing that. I do think men should provide. I also feel that, like, we can, like you said, have, um, I'm very pretty. Oh, stop. <laughs> That's my mama and my daddy. This all my mama. I look just like my daddy. Got a little bit of my mama. Thank you, though. Um, but I, I like what she's talking about because, yeah, I remember you. Because, <laughs> I remember my father was that engaged whether our opinions are the same or not. But I do think what she's saying is important or it makes a good point that this lady, her mom, grew up without her dad around. And so she was more drawn to a man that would take care of her and would do all these things for her. I personally wouldn't mind being a housewife and a stay-at-home mom because I got my crochet. I'm learning to sew. I write. I do this. I do that. So I would like that, I think. I'm saying that now. But I also wouldn't want to be shunned from not create income i wouldn't want to be shunned from not being able to do business now i get the whole maybe go through my husband type stuff but um and you know cooking and cleaning i like to nurture i like to do those things anyway i do those things for friends i have community kitchens and stuff so that's something i could rock with but um i just think some people are more geared toward it and then there's some people that um you crochet too okay I, I do it as like a side business like it's very lucrative but um i'm gonna just keep reading because i can give my opinions all day and we ain't gonna get nowhere all right so we stopped at jack lalane preparing meals waiting for her hard work now i never heard of jack lalane i heard of um what's the other exercise denise some white lady i don't remember my mama used to uh crochet love everybody out here hey <laughs> all right y'all silly all right but this apparent paradise soon collapsed my father was discovered by an on-the-job physicians to have the disease that is called epilepsy he was immediately fired from his long-time job as a truck driver his employer said that the possible blackouts that can accompany the disease were too dangerous for the trucking industry to risk after losing his job my father became deeply depressed i mean he was the provider i would too he had never liked the idea of his family receiving benefits or entitlements. He went on job interview after job interview only to discover that a black man has a hard and sometimes impossible task of finding and keeping a job. A sick black man has an even less of a chance. My father's conviction of what a man must be and do quickly collided with the reality of his unemployment, complicated by his having a socially and economically unacceptable disease. Soon his mental health began to erode. Through it all, he kept my mother from working, believing that that were she to do so, it would be a direct insult to his manhood. He grieved severely as benefits ran out and he could no longer provide for his wife and family. My mother, just 22 years old and utterly dependent on him, became frightened at his unraveling self-esteem and what seemed like his senseless ramblings. She fled to the projects with her three children. She had no money, no high school diploma, and few skills. She was, however, unmistakably beautiful, and she would use her looks if she thought she had to. She divorced my father. Oh, my God. He, however, did win the right to see us on the weekends when he was not out bugging 
One weekend when I was X years old, my father came to take my brother and I to the park. It was so far away from what we would have. It was so far away that we would have to take the subway. On the train, he talked endlessly about how we were not to trust anybody. He told us that we lived in the projects now and we would have to be a lot smarter than we were required to be before. We, of course, were normal children and were simply excited to see him and were eager to get on the swings. He rambled on while we blotted his words out. When we got to the park, he we went wild playing on everything in sight. Then my father called me over and asked me if I wanted to get on the slide. I happily and anxiously said, yes, daddy. I climbed to the top of the slide and said, daddy, I'm going to come down backwards. You catch me, okay? He said, come on, baby, come to daddy. With my full force and weight, I zoomed down and came crashing down onto the ground, causing my head to bleed. I started crying and screaming and asked my father, Daddy, why didn't you catch me? He smiled at me and doctored my wound and simply said, I told you not to trust anybody. Well, damn, Daddy. To hell? Kind of lesson. My father's visits became irregular. He went from representing one we loved. He went from representing one we love, who disciplined and instructed us to being something of a loved and favorite clown arriving on intermittent weekends with guilt-filled eyes and broken dreams, filling us up with endless chocolate bars, superfly movies, hot dogs, and toys. On the last evening that I was to see him for a while, we arrived with a picture of a crying clown. He told us to hang it on our wall, and when we looked at it, we should think of him because that's who I am. The projects were an endless maze in which a wrong turn could result in a little bleeding, a casual rape, a critical beatdown, or even death. It seemed the frustration level of each person was based on how many years they had been trapped within these concrete walls. Y'all y'all hearing about the projects? This is deep. The longer they had lived in the projects, the higher their frustration and the colder their attitude. We soon learned why. The first thing we had to acquaint ourselves with was the environment. Tall brown buildings, unofficial garbage dumps, no parks, roaches, rats, and mice. There were hundreds of mothers and thousands of children. There were rarely any conversations about fathers because between the two buildings in the immediate area where we live, there were only five families that had a father living in the house. Yet and still, there were men. Men on the corners, men on benches, men in the lobbies, and men in the parking lots fixing broken down cars. But these men seemed like rentals. They spent a certain amount of time in several different apartments doing everything they could to make it seem like they were not there to stay or even to be a permanent part of a family. They had distant relationships with the children of whichever woman they were screwing, never being called daddy or father. Usually children call them by their first name, names like Rob or Ted or, in the best of cases, Uncle Rob or Uncle Ted. These men's limited engagements with their children's mother were never taken seriously on a conscious level by the children. This was fine, of course, because that way the children openly showed their disrespect and disinterest in any of his rules or regulations, and the man got to do what he wanted to do anyway. Get the pussy, maybe a little cash, and don't have to say shit to the little bastards that weren't his anyway. These men were rentals, like a rental cars. They were temporary, expensive to keep, and subject to break down anytime, anywhere. They were rentals because they really belonged to someone else. In fact, most of these men had children of their own elsewhere in the ghetto but they had long since fled that responsibility the common thing was that these men were unemployed and spent most of their time standing around talking to one another decorating the neighborhood when my mother moved in there was talk about among these men she was considered the finest piece of ass they had seen in a good long while they wondered where she came from and what fool had turned her loose they were shocked that she had three children something they learned by watching her walk with us hand in hand in and out of stores and welfare agencies they said she looked like she was only 16 years old with her booming body and tight little pussy Soon, a wager was set on who could fuck her first. When we walked down the street, they would call out, Hey, baby, give me some of that jelly. But my mother was what the women in the projects called stuck up. This simply meant that she hadn't been around long enough to lose her pride, that her spirit was not yet broken. It meant that she didn't sit around gossiping with them and telling all her business. She wasn't smoking reefer or shooting drugs, and she wasn't giving up pussy. The impact of my mother's ways could be felt by the men in the area who were used to getting same-day service. It caused them to increase the bet and made the prize seem that much sweeter. 
The women in the projects were peculiar. The attention my mother got from the fools made them hate her. They said, who does she think she is? You on welfare just like us, bitch. Think you too damn good? These women had fully accepted the lifestyle and conditions of the projects. They accepted men as rentals. They gave up their stuff freely with few expectations or demands. When one of them got her teeth knocked out by the man she was temporarily screwing, she would run and tell the other women in the building. They would tell her why she deserved the ass whooping and then one of them would start screwing the same men. The conversations among these women ranged between the new outfit they put on layaway at the department store and the matching shoes or who had a weave, whose hair was real, who was the father of so-and-so's baby and what new entertainer they wanted to get with. The deepest the conversations ever seemed to get was whether or not Welfare had cheated one of them out of money that month or how they had gotten over in their check for 10 or $50 dollars. You can imagine the children of these mothers. We learn young that people were considered worthless. Kid fought, kids fought that image by dressing up. Clothes were the only things that seemed accessible on a dead-end budget. No one owned cars or houses or bank accounts. Any extra money went toward buying leather, suede, sneakers, expensive denim outfits, and second-rate jewelry sold to us at 14 and 18 karat gold. The mindset was day-to-day. No one planned for or expected anything in the future. Children learned quick how the projects were divided into camps. There were the good kids whose mothers feared for their lives and kept them locked in, or a high highly supervised schedule. There were kids whose mothers were absolutely crazy. As a result, they raised themselves in the environment and beat up and preyed on the good kids for basic survival. Then there were the average kids who knew the rules, grew a hard exterior, didn't want to fight, but would if they had to. Sometimes they won and sometimes they lost, but they knew a good fight was better than being a permanent victim. They played hard and had street laws of loyalty. They didn't like cops, took no great interest in school, and didn't think long range about careers, business, or growing old. Uh, we also had to adjust to the welfare system and its bureaucrats. They wanted to know everything, and I mean everything. Not just your address and social security number and birthday. They would ask my mother if she had a boyfriend, and if she did, did he give her any money so they could deduct it from the extremely small amount of welfare money they were giving her each money each month. They wanted to know if she received any gifts from men or from her family. If she, for example, received a toaster as a gift, she had to report it to the agency so they could deduct its value from her welfare check. The welfare agency will authorize the social worker to roam freely through your apartment to report any findings. Findings could include men, uh, extra toys, new furniture, etc. Everything was organized to make it clear that they as the government were your parents and you, as dependents, were children. The welfare workers acted as though they were paying our monthly benefits out their own pockets. They became indignant if you asked questions about your case or if you challenged any of the information they were giving you. The services were designed to make us feel inferior. For instance, we had to stand online some day starting at 8 o'clock in the morning or until they got ready to open, until 4 or 5 in the afternoon, merely to receive two blocks of cheese butter and two big steel cans of peanut butter. When you finally got up to the front desk, you will be asked a whole new round of personal questions in front of what seemed like scores of other people's. There were no private offices. The welfare worker would talk loudly to embarrass you. If you responded softly as though you wanted some privacy or confidentiality, she would broadcast your responses by repeating them loudly. For medical services, you had to spend the roulette wheel and wait for a clinic appointment. You arrived at 8 a.m. to stand in line, even though you had an appointment, and it was best to plan to spend your entire day in the clinic. This is so real. <laughs> like, this is, to this day, this is how it is. I um used to go to the food stamp office, and it's long. It's a thousand people in their way, and you already know. Excuse me. You need to go on your day off. You can't, this ain't something you can just go on your break at work and think you're going to get done in 30 minutes. It's very dehumanizing and it just, it, it's not a comfortable feeling. And it's systematically set up this way. Like that's, that's what they want. They, this is, this is, and these are the things she's talking about all with the, um, the welfare mothers and their kids. That's the extent of how it is in the hood, in the projects. All you got to talk about is the latest clothing. And now she wrote this back in. This is 95. So this is before like Google was popping good, reality TV shows. So now it's like you still talk about weaves in here, but now you're also talking about reality star drama and all this other stuff. And they just make it super hard. They want to know all your business. They um, it, it keeps um, families, black men and women staying together 
because it's um they checking for if men are staying with you then they have deducted or you can't have men staying there with you so it's a it's a base for single mothers and um no fathers in the home so ain't nothing changed since 95 when she wrote this book the basic assumption of welfare was that since you were on it, you, of course, had time to stand in lines, wait in lobby, stay home, waiting for social workers, simply because you obviously had nothing else to do. Self-improvement in the welfare system at this time was unknown. For instance, if you were on welfare and you found a job, you had to immediately report it to the welfare department or risk prosecution as a welfare fraud. If you were foolish enough to go to the honest route, the, well the welfare agency would take away your rent subsidy and raise the rent to full market value. They would cancel your Medicaid so your children no longer qualify for subsidized health services. They would cut your food stamps in half and slash your monthly benefit check. This strikes some people as fair since you are now employed not to be able to pay your own. Here's the catch. If you are on welfare and you get a job, usually it is minimum wage employment with no benefits. Therefore, when you report your new job to the agency and they cut and scale down your benefits, you now earn less money from your job than you would have if you had simply stayed home doing nothing. So, to take make means make ends meet you have to quit your job or say you get a decent job with a decent wage above the minimum you report it to welfare and one of your children gets a common illness like chicken pox the private medical fees will still actually cost more than the decent wage you earn so in fear of medical bills and wanting to protect those services for your children you quit your job to regain medicaid or say you decide you've met a good man you would like to get married and try again at having a family. You must report it to welfare and they will cancel everything because you are not allowed to be married and receive welfare benefits. This policy perversely encourages single mother households as women are asked to choose between their man and the financial survival of their children. It destroys any impulse of self-improvement. It is a system designed to fail. It was not long before my older brother and I learned the rules of our new life and the projects. We must stick together at all times. We must go downstairs together and all come back upstairs together. No matter how much fun we were having with our friends, we were not to lose track of our younger sister or we would be beaten. If anybody put their hands on us, we were to all jump in and beat them senseless. If one of us got beat up and the other one did not help, we would all be beaten when we got home. When we were sent to the corner candy store where everybody around brought their overpriced groceries, we were to take the money, hold it tight, and securely if we were supposed if we were to lose the money or have it taken from us we would all be beaten we were not to talk to strangers we were not to get into anyone's car or even approach their window no visiting any friend's apartment without permission we were to stay off the roof and out of the cellar we were not allowed to play in the dumps a local toxic waste dump neighborhood children use for the playground we were not to let anyone put their hands on our private parts. If they tried to, we were to tell mommy immediately. We were not to sit on anyone's lap, not even daddy's. We were never to tell anyone our personal business, no matter who they were. If anybody called the house, we were to say, my mother is not available right now. That is so true. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is black living, um, as opposed to she's not home. So if anybody called the house, we were to say, my mother's not available right now, as opposed to she's not home. We were not to tell anyone where she was or when she would return. Just take a message and hang up the phone. When the welfare lady comes, no talking. Show good manners, stay in your room, and if she comes in, answer no questions. If anybody tried to trick you, you were to say, I don't know, you'll have to ask my mommy. New York people hustle, got public assistance or a job. You had to combine two things together to make it, but people were slicker back then. Somebody figured out how to get around it, and everybody learned you had to be slick. Yes, you got to be slick. It's sad that you have to be slick, though. You know what I'm saying? Um, it became obvious to us that we were living in a war zone. My mother thought church would be a DM thought church would be a DMZ and she made sure we attended every Sunday. I found it confusing. While it did challenge me to think about many things that I would not have ordinarily thought about, the teachings just never added up. We went to a non-denominational Christian church. I was told that non-denominational meant that everyone was welcome and that titles like Baptist, Catholic, or Methodist were not important, just the universal belief in God. There was no dress code. The church was come as you are, as you please. We were told that God loved us no matter what we wore. My great-grandmother was the pastor. My great-grandfather was dead. Nobody grieved too much over him, however, because they said that he gave my great-grandmother 14 children and left her to raise them alone most of the time while he was out romancing the young skirts. He ended up in a mental institution, and many people say he got what he deserved. My great-aunts and uncles, all in either their mid-30s or 40s, were the deacons and deaconesses. They were also people from the surrounding 
surrounding Brock's community. Most of them were either having marital problems or divorced. Most of them were having serious problems raising their children and keeping them healthy and alive. I remember that one male cousin died of an overdose on heroin. Another was locked up for rape. Yet another was shot in the head and murdered because of a drug deal gone sour. His father buried him in a $500 suit with a $100 bill clutched in his hand. What? Yet another was shot in the head and murdered because of a drug deal gone sour. His father buried him in a $500 suit with $100 bills plural, clutched in his hand. If that ain't the dumbest law of black people and how we spend our money. I had several female cousins who were single mothers, each of their children having different fathers. I had an aunt who, after a brutal marriage, sent her children off to college and moved in with her woman, never to return to the life of heterosexuality. Most of the other women in the family were physically attractive and were surviving financially by keeping a steady flow of boyfriends as a source of cash. Even though these problems affected most everyone in the congregation, we never discussed any of these things in church. Nor did we talk about the definition of family and how to keep one together. The cause of difficult times in the world, racial problems, or how to develop one's mind intellectually and spiritually to overcome these difficulties. Instead, we were told simple generalities. We were read scriptures that seemed to have little to do with life in modern times. If anything went wrong, it was because of the devil or because you were listening to the voice of the devil. But I wanted to know, just who was the devil? How did the devil get this power and maintain it so well? How do we recognize him? How do we recognize his work? How do we tell the difference between good and evil? What is the criteria? We were told that there was no need to be angry about anything or with anybody because God loved us and he gave unselfishly his only son Jesus for the world. God forgives, so too must we not be angry. We must be forgiving people. We were told that Jesus was nailed to the cross and he wasn't angry, so why should we complain about our little bit of suffering? We were taught to do unto others as you wish others would do unto you. This made us peaceful, but when we were peaceful, we were still the targets of violence. But in answer to that violence, we were taught that two wrongs don't make it right. So we were encouraged to give love and accept hate and bad treatment in return. To seal the argument, we were told that Jesus turned the other cheek while fighting evil and injustice. We were urged to count our blessings and look toward the bright side of things. So instead of banding together and discussing and developing a plan to save the broken lives and spirit of the shattered families in the congregation, we got together at the big houses of a couple of wealthy uncles who had succeeded, and there we celebrated family, life, birthdays, etc. At these celebrations, however, there were alcoholic drinks there were reefer sets for the get high crews of aunts and uncles car games and gambling you name it you got to meet the new female interests of the few of the men and new male interests of the women um one year my uncle brought a white girl as his date she wore a see-through dress and no panties and screwed whichever uncle paid her attention at the time everyone's children ran around the house and played in the backyard i saw the difference between what adults said and what they did I did too. That's why I had the conversations I have on my page that sounds so much like what she's talking about in this book. Stuff don't add up for me. I've not seen positive, healthy relationships. I've not seen longevity in marriage. I've not heard anybody sit down and talk to me about marriage or about why it's important or how to treat and interact with men. I haven't been around a lot of masculine men raising me, teaching me how men interact. So I'm having to learn all of this in my 20s went to college like but went to church and you go to church and you just listen to the good word and then you back to your sin the rest of the week hmm. I saw the difference between what adults said and what they did and you couldn't question that because you was being grown or being smart or you do as I say and not as I do well you are the example so I'm going to do what you do too boo as soon as I get old enough, do what I want to do. I'm going to do what you do. Because that's what I want to do. Sorry. I'll be acting all. All right. My confusion grew. And church became more of a ceremony or empty performance than something that could be taken seriously. That's why I left church. Nevertheless, I began a private relationship with God. I said my prayers every morning and every night. I thank God for life and for seeing a new day. Something my great-grandmother had taught me to do. I also had deep discussions with God about all the emotions I felt. The most overwhelming one was fear. I explained to him that living in the projects was scary to me and that each and every day I feared for the life of my mother. I told how much 
I hated the men on the corner with their sexual comments and fantasies. I talked to God about the drug problem and how it seemed like every other person was shooting heroin into their arms. The drugs stole their mind, robbed their physical beauty, denied them their future. I said how I knew that the fruit drinks made for children at block parties and public events were being spiked to get more drug addicts and boost drug sales. I confided that I feared that one of the junkies would enter my room at night and inject me with some heroin and make me go crazy. That's why I slept on top of my arms even though it gave me cramps we discussed my nightmares that shook me awake above all i told god how much i love my mother brother and my little sister and asked him to protect me from the bad men i prayed for strength survival protection and life for better times in exchange for my prayers being answered i offer god my faith obedience and promise to be good and work hard always in his name well, fast say this is how I was. My parents' marriage failed. Mine failed. I'm learning all over again. Oh, fast, we gotta talk. You been married, boo? Oh, wow. And I'm hella nervous because I don't want to get divorced. And I've never been proposed to. I've never really had a serious monogamous relationship with a brother. Most, my situationships, I can think of three off gate that I've had in my 20s. One in my early 20s. One in my mid 20s. And one two years ago. I'm 28 now. And those were all situationships they were guys that i had a strong attraction or relation to um and they just uh it was more so like you start off as business partners or you just friends or they move in with me and you were just roommates but they was getting you know having sex with you raw y'all had nicknames you cooking for them they might have been giving me their checks or helping with the rent and so it's like i've never even had that just serious monogamous i want to be with you because i rock with you morgan type relationship so that makes me super hesitant the, the fact that i've not seen healthy marriages and relationships in my own family and then i've never had a serious and i've been open to polygamy i've tried to do different hey cuz i've tried to do different um i was in like because i felt in my eyes i was told by my mother growing up all men cheat so i already have that mindset i've already not been in a, a monogamous relationship with a man that has claimed me and titles was a big thing let's, let's just go with the flow dudes don't want titles so i've not had that and then it's just, it seems like that's what most people break up about or are insecure about about their man cheating and i don't like going through men's phone i have done it before i didn't like what i saw and just from what i hear when people do it is so i'm like okay well if a man can be upfront and honest that he wants more than one woman i can get down with that like let me let us at least be in alignment let me insist because and from what i understand and from an economic standpoint it sounded like a good thing we could all put our money together we ain't gonna all worry about having different spaces and different bills and um most people even like how she's talking about in this book um my father included have multiple kids by multiple women usually in the same city or nearby so it's like well let me get with a man that's up front about how that's what he want i can know who the other woman is our kids can be raised together if she have lactation issues um while after she have a baby and i'm pregnant too maybe i can give her some of my titty milk like i was so with it and these brothers um one didn't have the economic standpoint the mental health was real and it just didn't pan out and i tried that twice <laughs> so it's like i have a fear of like getting married and it not working out and i know things happen things change and that's why i think i'm kind of with the goal of the flow will i be a free spirit will i just have a love in different states because i get love from men i have a lot of great guy friends so maybe i'll that might just be my path to like have the conversations about relationships and family but maybe i won't have one on my own i don't know i'm still learning yes i was married young and, and so did my parents i got married early because my mother suggested that my longtime boyfriend and i get married and we weren't shacking up i used to do things because my mother wanted me to and it still didn't work out how could i follow somebody else's example who didn't give me good examples i get that maybe your experience could lend you to give good advice but it didn't for me but i had seen no successful marriages i had step parents and that seemed to work best so now naturally i'm open more to polygamy oh you want to be my sister wife sis let's find us a man <laughs> okay <laughs> i can't do this all right soon one of these men from the corner was in my house his name was tyrone ty for short he was considered the slickest nigga around since we all lived in a constant state of fear i sensed my mother felt more security in the fact that he had the juice around the neighborhood he told the drug addicts to skip our apartment when they were out robbing houses he put the word out on the streets that he was fucking my mother so don't nobody better mess with his shit my mother would now walk down the street and none of the men would say anything disrespectful for fear that ty would punish them 
like most men around the way. He usually came in the evening. Even though he had no job, he ran his schedule like he had one. He felt extra large about conquering my mother's booty since he had been on the block so long and no other guy got to tax it. The scary thing to me, however, was that he wore a green army coat. I had come to fear all men in green army coats, and when I'd see them in the building, I'd run off. If one of them was coming into our, our apartment, I'd scream. One night, he came while I was still awake. My mother asked him to take off the coat and leave it in the front closet, explaining that her daughter was oversensitive and had a complex about army coats. He agreed to take it off that night, but added that the first time would that the first time would be the last time. He told my mother he would have to talk with me, that he would have a talk with me. Before I went to bed, he called me into the living room to ask me why I screamed when I saw green army coats. I said, because everybody I see wearing them is crazy. He said, how do you know they crazy? I said, because of what they be doing. He laughed and said, what they be doing? Talking to themselves, singing real loud when nobody's listening, dying off and falling down, or just looking crazy like they're going to hurt somebody. Why do they do that? He asked. I don't know, I said. Don't tell me you don't know why. That's too easy. By now, my eyes was filled up with tears. I looked him back in his face with a blank stare. He said, all right, I'll tell you what. You can go back to your room and you think about why they do the things they do. The next time you see me, I want you to tell me your answer. Life ain't got no rewards for people who don't know how to think. Mm. Them hustlers, that's how they get you, boy. Hey, uh, Ayata and Nadir Rahman. Miss Rahman, my dance teacher, hey girl. I have the same fear of marriage. Polygamy sounds good on paper to me too, but it hasn't seemed to work in real life in the most the instances that I know about. It I know, right? It's like And you and you a grown grown woman, Patricia. So like I just I don't know. I think I'll just treat keep creating good relationships. If it's meant to be, it'll be for me, I reckon. I'm just not rushing nothing at this point. Because, like I said, and I be giving my all. like, And I was, this is the first time I had heard about polygamy was two years ago. And I was, like, not with it. But then I got on board with it. And I was, like, what I think would have been a stellar sister wife. The women that was involved, I was making YouTube videos and sending them links. Like, it was a private link. And I was just, you know, trying to get to know them. Asking them questions. How we would run things in the home. How would the bedroom situation be set up. Because... Um, I don't think I would be, like, comfortable. I don't want to sleep with all y'all in the bed and I don't want to sleep with three or four people. I'm I'm just sorry. Like, I think if we had separate rooms or even separate houses on the same block, because you know how women do. We like to run our kitchen a certain way. We like to do our chores a certain way. And whether it's jealousy or westernization or whatever, we just like to do things our own way. So too many women can be a problem if we all in the way um so i and i didn't want to be subjected to having to have sexual relations with these women because i like penis um so that's not what i wanted to do after the vietnam war lots of dudes came back crazy drunk and high on heroin she she's about my age so that might be what she's talking about good context clues patricia that's what i think she's talking about too that's why he made her go think about it not even little girls hold on Okay, the next time you see me, I want you to tell me your answer. Life ain't got no rewards for people who don't know how to think. Not even little girls. I dropped my head and turned away, whispering goodnight to my mother. Two days later, Tyrone came to visit my mother again. He called me out of my room as soon as he arrived. He kept his army coat on, and when I saw it, I took a deep breath and stared and started to back down the hallway. Come here. He said, I looked at my mother wide-eyed as she stood helplessly behind him. I searched her eyes for support. She looked sympathetic, but she made it clear with her eyes that she was no longer in charge. He repeated himself, come here. I inched toward him slowly. Here, touch my sleeve. I looked at my mother because she had already told me no touching. She nodded as if to say, yes, go ahead. I touched it. He said, this is a coat. Only a coat. It's green and it's made out of material. It has no arms, no legs, and it cannot hurt you. Do you understand? Yes, I replied, almost in a whisper. Now, what's your answer to my question? He asked. Because they don't say... What's the answer to my question? He asked. Because they don't say their prayers. He laughed. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> what? I felt betrayed by his laughter, but I explained. The men in green army clothes act crazy because they don't say their prayers. He said, who told you that? I replied, nobody. He said, well, where did you get it from? I said, mommy said, if you say your prayers, God will protect you. But if you don't say them, you could lose your way and go crazy. When did she tell you that? He asked. When we lived at the other house, I said softly. Here, step into my office. He pointed toward the kitchen and pulled out a chair. I sat down. 
the black men in the army coats are men who came home from the Vietnam War. Right, Patricia? I didn't know what he was talking about. He went on to explain that there had been a war in a faraway place, that black men I saw in the green coats had fought in the war. They had seen a lot of ugly things like blood and death. He said they had killed other men, women, and children. They didn't want to do it, but they were ordered to do it. Otherwise, they themselves would be put in jail or even killed. He said that the people in charge of America had sent these black men to go fight for them. It was against the law for them to refuse to go. He said the people in charge were white punk who sent strong black men to go and fight their battles. He compared the people in charge to the punks around the way who would talk a lot of shit and can't back it up when it's time to throw down. So they run and get somebody else to fight their battles for them. He said the black men in green army coats fought hard for the white government punks and some of them had even lost their legs, arms, and lives. When the ones who made it out returned, the white punks who were in charge but always hated them anyway wouldn't give them jobs, pay them money, or respect. So, he said, some of them are crazy because they kill other human beings in Vietnam. Some of them are crazy because they couldn't find jobs to support their own selves or family when they got home. Some of them went crazy because they saw their own girl, their own friends get killed. Some of them are crazy because they own drugs. He then looked me in the eye and said, but no matter how crazy they are, always remember the black team is your team. That's all you have to work with. That doesn't mean you can always trust the black team, but better than being scared of the people on your own team is being smart. Smart people, he said, can always outslick the dumb ones and stay alive. He added that if you were dumb and didn't know how to think, you would always be beaten up and picked up by big dumb guys. Then he said he wanted to make a deal with me. Go and get your brother. I went and got my brother. We stood in front of Tyrone. He said he would give me and my brother a dollar fifty per week if we both learned how to think and be smart because he don't like being around no dummies. He said every day we had to try to read the first three pages of the New York Daily News plus two comic strips, Beetle Bailey and Blondie. Then on Wednesday nights, he would give us a puzzle to solve. If we could solve the puzzles or brain teasers, then on Fridays, we would get paid. If we couldn't solve the puzzles, it meant that we still didn't know how to think so we wouldn't get a dime. We both smiled, accepted the deal, and ran to our rooms. For the next, th think how powerful that is. Having black men in a home that are telling kids that they need to think, and then challenging them and giving—that's something that I'm learning. I don't have kids, but that's something that I've learned as an educator and in the school system. You can talk all day, but when you give some kids some a fun activity to do, or um, what's it? What's the type of teaching called? I can't remember, but it's like when you're interacting with them, when you're making them do things that are fun, it sticks. It, it act, They actually memorize it instead of just, um, excuse me, they retain it. Instead of just memorizing it for a test, they actually retain what they're learning. So I'm liking this Tyrone character. He probably out here selling crap to these people that didn't came home from the war, but he sounded like a great guy. Tyrone was the real MVP. For the next six or seven months, I was happy when Tyrone came over as my mother. Blah, 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 blah. For the next six or seven months, I was as ha I was as happy when Tyrone came over as my mother was. So was my brother. Ty taught me how to outslick the bully Dario who lived downstairs from us and always took little kids money. He taught him how to fight, how to walk, and how not to look like a sucker. Some of that fear that gripped us slipped away. There were things that confused me, though, about Tyrone. He seemed like a good person, but some nights I would wake up real late and hear my mother screaming. She wouldn't be saying words I could understand, just making noises. Sometimes I would hear her laugh, but then sometimes it sounded like she was crying. A few times I'd hear his voice cry out, too. I don't want to think about... I don't want to think that he was hurting her because... I didn't like thinking that way about him, but my love for my mother was more important to me. Finally, after listening to their noises, I got out of my bed, went to my mother's closed door and knocked. Mommy, are you okay? You know they end up, they getting it in. She would say, yes, I'm fine. Go back to bed. All right. Yes, I'm fine. Go back to bed. After I did this every night for about a week, my mother became very aggravated with me. And soon she said, get back in that bed. Now I want you to get up and knock on my door again. So I stopped getting up, but I was still listening to the noises that confused me. One night, things were different. I heard banging on the front door and Tyrone screaming, come on, peaches, open the door, open the door. My mother, who I could tell was standing inside our apartment on the other side of the door, was crying, no, she screamed. Yeah, hi, I have children in here. You stay out there. Tyrone refused to leave. He banged on the door all night to early the next morning. I laid in my bed, paralyzed with fear, and decided on that night that whatever this thing called love that mommy and daddy and then Tyrone and mommy had, I was not going to have. I mean, I would always love my mother and my family, but not no man-woman love. It was too. It was all too painful, and I don't like no pain. 
If we were using musical instruments to describe what went on in the next few months, we would need the entire orchestra. We would use flutes to define the happy times when me and my brother were learning and laughing or when Tyrone took us all to the movies. We would use big bass drums to describe Tyrone's mind attacks and fits of anger when he would wake up screaming because mommy said sometimes he forgot that the Vietnam War was over. We would use saxophones to signify our pain and tears as we cried over broken promises and strange behavior. We really need an electric guitar to play as Tyrone tiptoed around our apartment stealing the money my mother had saved to go Christmas shopping. Pianos to play soft music as me, my brother, sister, and mother sat under the empty Christmas tree on Christmas Day. The bass violins to give you the sound of our hearts dropping when Tyrone would appear after long disappearances. A clarinet to play as he snaked his way back into all our hearts. And while the projects enveloped us and our home life confused us, our Italian, Irish, German, and Jewish born school teachers who lived nowhere near our neighborhoods filled us up with Kool-Aid and chocolate chip cookies singing B-I-N-G-O and Bingo was his name. Oh. While the sugar raced through our bloodstreams, a classroom full of black kids bounced off the walls and ceilings. The teacher shouted over our voices, Why don't you all just sit down and keep still? When we finally calmed down, Mrs. Pelletary or Mrs. Greenwall would read us a story about Cinderella or tell us how George Washington never told a lie. <laughs> That's how that good deal. <laughs> It'll get you roped up, won't it? One day, my mother announced that she was pregnant and not about to get an abortion like the other tramps in the building. After all, how could they feel life in belly and voluntarily snatch his breath away? My brother and sister and I went through all the stages of the pregnancy along with my mother. Tyrone, however, checked in and checked out. By the fifth month, rumors spread around the neighborhood that Ty was now fucking Ms. Marjorie. She was the new light-skinned cutie on the seventh floor. My mother paced around the apartment, mumbling about how she wasn't going to put up with Vietnam flashbacks, malaria, breakdown, lying, stealing, and and now Ms. Margie upstairs. Later that night, she broke up with Tyrone, or should I say, through his actions, he broke up with her. Whatever the case, while my mother cried in the living room, I cried in the bedroom, because when he left her, he left me, and her pain was mine, too. Word flew around the neighborhood that Ty and Peaches were through after almost two years, and even though my mother was pregnant, men still found her desirable. We therefore were to meet a few more men from the neighborhood, but we had learned not to take them seriously. They were just rentals passing through. As my mother brought life into the world, a baby girl, the project spit up death. Yolanda, the woman upstairs, stabbed her man in the heart several times and killed him. Everyone said he came home drunk all the time and would beat her ass good. Well, this time she wasn't going for it, so she fought back in defense, and that ended and murder. I tried to understand the murder of somebody I knew personally. I tried to picture it in my head. Night after night I see my version of the scene and it all made me feel sick and empty. So I talked to God about death and what it meant and why it happened. The people around me seemed not to mind though. Or if they did, they didn't show it. Yolanda was out of jail in a jiffy and walking around smiling and partying like nothing happened. A month or two later, a friend of mine named Dwayne stabbed and killed another little boy over a kickball. Dwayne was seven years old. My God. Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> yeah, why teachers don't understand these kids? I really don't think they should be teaching our kids, but that's another story for another day. Around this time, my mother started dating a policeman from the area. Okay, policeman. She needed to see. She needed that protector, that provider. And that's what Tyrone, along with the good D, he provided. He was the, the slickest nigga on the block. He kept the druggies and all the dudes from hollering like, excuse me, mama needed that protection. She came from a home where her man would do everything for her until he got uh, his health waned and then um, the mental health and then she divorced him, which ain't right, right? And it through death to a part, through sickness and the health, the man got sick. But she wasn't used to working, so then she went to the projects and welfare and now she's trying to get women that can protect and provide. Mm, ain't that interesting? Okay, Dwayne, seven years old, out here killing kids. Jesus. Around this time, my mother started dating a policeman from the area. He was six foot five and over 240 pounds. He was the new chief of security. They would talk at night, and I would listen about how bad the neighborhood was getting and how we needed to get out of the projects. But he was in the middle of a divorce and had no money. It wasn't long before a word was out on the street that Slick Tyrone had gotten played out by a cop. In answer to the gossip, Tyrone put out the word that he wanted his baby and was coming to get it. The cop, who people called Big Big Joe then made it clear to everyone in the neighborhood that he was licensed to carry a gun and wouldn't hesitate to use it. He told my mother privately, however, that he was smart enough to know that niggas are crazy because he himself was a crazy nigga. So he planned to get my mother out the projects after what had been a wild five years for us. 
In June, at the end of third grade, a U-Haul truck arrived at my school. My mother appeared in my classroom and grabbed my arm. She had my brother and two sisters with her. She stuffed us in the truck. I cried and said my books and stuff were still inside my school desk. And where are we going anyway? She said, shut up. No questions today. We ended up in my grandmother's house in Teaneck, New Jersey, where she lived with her second husband, a, long, a longshoreman. My grandmother was not pleased to have the house that she spent her life working to put a down payment on invaded by her single daughter and her four rowdy children. She let my mother know that this was temporary housing very temporary so my mother shifted us back and forth between big joe's apartment in new york and my grandmother's house when my grandmother tried to transfer to the welfare department in bergen county it was more than difficult the policy was that if people had extended families or lived with relatives their families should take care of them this policy ignored the fact that while my grandmother was a member of the new black middle class, she was living from paycheck to paycheck with very little money in the bank. Not only was she not capable of supporting or supplementing the income of my mother and her four children, she herself was interested in receiving money for rent and the additional utility expenses. Teaneck was different. There were blacks who owned houses. There were trees, grass, parks, smiling faces. The fear that had gripped my heart every day for five years in the projects began to slowly ebb. But in Teaneck, there were also attitudes. I remember my mother sent me to the store for some milk for the baby and gave me some food stamps when i arrived at the counter to pay the white cashier i handed her the food coupons and she screwed up her old wrinkled face and said what is this i stood silent for 10 seconds not even understanding what she was really asking since i had always bought food with the stamps then i said they food stamps she reached beneath the counter and pulled out a small silver bell and started ringing it loudly, calling for the manager. All the black people behind me started huffing and puffing and sucking their teeth. Eventually, the manager came and said, We can take the stance, but we cannot give you cash for change. Well, you can't keep my change, I said in my best New York style. He then handed me square small square pieces of paper and plastic chips and said I could purchase food from this market with these papers and chips. They looked like play money to me. I grabbed my stuff and walked away embarrassed. When I got home, my mother said I shouldn't be embarrassed, but later on, I noticed she always sent me to the store instead of going herself. We lived in Teaneck for the next year and a half. The strange thing was that even though the physical environment had improved from the project, the economic and psycho-spiritual conditions of life did not. In fact, because we were surrounded by both black and white working and professional people, our impoverished condition became even more apparent to us. Because we were living in my grandmother's house, we had the opportunity to act like we were doing okay. The fact still remained, however, that the house, the neighborhood, and none of the material things belonged to us. My mother got a job working at the telephone company company working from four o'clock in the afternoon into midnight this left the responsibility of raising my infant sister to me i did everything from preparing bottles changing diapers laundry bathing cooking and talking and rocking her to sleep at night i also had to watch my other little sister who was full of energy and mischievousness we stopped going to church regularly because my mother said it cost too much money to cross the george washington bridge besides we really had access to a car that worked when I asked about the churches in Teaneck, my mother said I had to understand that these churches were uppity and we didn't have enough clothes or money to attend them. Their attitudes were not like great grandma's church and they would make us feel uncomfortable and unwelcome. So I continued to say my prayers personally to God. On some weekends, Big Joe would come and pick us up and take us back to New York. We would stay in his building where we played with our black and Latino friends while mommy and Joe stayed upstairs. Eventually, my mother and Big Joe found a two-family house for rent in Inglewood. Big Joe, however, had been laid off of the police force without pay until his trial for having shot and killed a black youth ended. What? Big Joe was a tyrant, and my brothers and sisters all hated him. He wanted everything to revolve around him. He demanded that we automatically agree with him, not because he was right, but because he was in charge. So we plotted to get rid of him. One day, we painted the toilet seat black and didn't tell him. He sat on it and got a paint ring around his butt. We laughed so hard, we nearly cried. The fact of the matter, however, was that he helped to get rid of himself. He was so insecure and possessive over my mother that he didn't want to take her night court that he didn't want her to take night courses at the local community college. But my mother, after having experienced my real father, told me to never, no matter what, allow a man to interrupt your work or education. She had earned her high school diploma since her divorce. She made it clear that Big Joe had better stop nagging her about her enrollment. Suspended from the job he loved, Big Joe was reduced to driving taxis and doing odd jobs. Eventually, the frustration and differences in opinions about the way things should be done led he and my mother to part their ways. We, of course, headed back to welfare since he was no longer there to pay his half of our meager existence. 
I started school halfway into my fifth grade year in Inglewood. On my first day of class, I was told by the other children that where I lived on Spindale Avenue was the cheapest and lowest block in Inglewood. They said I would be tested by the teachers and placed in classes based on how dumb or smart I was. They said that everybody from Spindale was dumb, so I'd probably go to the special ed with the rest of them. I, as a little black child, was shocked to see little black children and little white children joining together to jump on top of me. In New York, such a thing would never happen. The blacks stuck with the blacks, the Puerto Ricans with the Puerto Ricans, the whites stuck with the whites. The only exception of this rule was when the Puerto Ricans and blacks united to fight the whites. These Inglewood kids, however, had no concept of color or black unity, and for reasons which eluded me, these little black children thought that they were the same as the little white children. It soon became obvious to me that they were not the same. Only black children filled up the special education classes. Instead of reading books, they played checkers, watched television, beat each other up, all with the teacher's permission, supervision, and indifference. The term special education was, in fact, synonymous with the black children who would be written off as uneducable by the time they were 11 or 12. The intermediate classes were mostly whites with only a few blacks. The top and most intelligent classes were almost entirely white and had no more than a handful of black students in each discipline, whether it was English, science, mathematics, or history. As this little integrated goon squad taunted me, I remained silent. I remember thinking how backward and different they were from the kids I had known in New York. Inside, I was not worried about what they were saying because I knew I would be placed in the top classes in every area. Ever since I was four years old, my mother made sure I had my public library card. I knew, as any New York street kid would know, that I was more mature. I wasn't even 10 yet, and already I had experienced two murders, several drug overdoses, mental illness, danger, and poverty. I could cook any of two dozen different meals, meats, vegetables, salads, and desserts. I could take care of babies down to the most minute detail. I could think fast and felt I could mentally outmaneuver adults. I could maintain an entire family while presenting to the world the illusion that my mother was home with us. I was articulate and prepared in math, science, reading, sport, and play. After all, this is what I had promised. Promise God I would do. It was easy to see why black children in Inglewood were confused about who they were. What we were taught was ridiculous. No teacher gave black children any reason to take pride in their color, in their origins, in their past. Never did anyone tell us we were a people of great antiquity whose contributions to civilization were many and profound. The unique cause of our presence in America, slavery and racism, was not discussed. Yet I remember spending months in social studies learning about Eskimos in Alaska and the most advanced English class where I was placed alongside two other blacks we were asked to read Siddhartha Becomes the Buddha an Asian play by Sri Kremnoy we also read of course great poetry and essays by great Europeans and great white people in America great black poets and writers and statesmen were nowhere to be found this in a school system that was 60% black still today still today the parents of the black children were confused as well. Either they were overworked and poorly educated, thus disconnected and uninvolved in the schooling of their children, or they were black professionals interested in advancing in the white business world and assumed that to be successful, they had to accept and even celebrate white culture like their children in the advanced classes. Even though many of these parents were homeowners and paid a good amount of tax money, they demanded nothing substantial in exchange for it. There was no movement for an African-centered curriculum, no push for racial consciousness and special programs. There was no real movement for collective political and economic power. Instead, the black parents were merely along as the white children received the benefits and, and per preferential? Preferential arrangements. On my phone, I gotta look that up. Preferential. Here's the definition of. Chill. How did you get chill from that? Preferential. Here's the definition of preferential. Preferential. Of or involving preference or partiality, okay. constituting a favor or privilege. Okay, of or involving preference or partiality constituting a favor of privilege or privilege. Okay, preferential arrangements. Okay, so the black parents went merely along with the white children, with what the white children received, the benefits and preferential arrangements. And there were many that were provided through the tax dollars of both black and white working people. In fact, the black parents went to great lengths 
to prove that they were not black and conscious or black and hostile or black and demanding. They attended all kinds of integrated unity festivals and candlelit unity sing-alongs. They will openly denounce and distance themselves from any black person who spoke of organizing events that were specifically black in agenda and orientation. Unless, of course, it was about the early years of Martin Luther King Jr. and his sacred I Have a Dream speech. Any event the black parents organized, they were at pains to stress that it was for everybody. Meanwhile, many white students and their parents attended separate, all-white, semi-private community gatherings, separate Hebrew schools and Jewish community centers where black children were not allowed. Now, of course, there's no sign hanging in the window saying, nigga, keep out. It wasn't necessary. When they wanted to exclude you, they would simply not invite you or raise admission prices beyond the reach of the average black family or claim their gatherings were religious. If they were caught discriminating with tax public taxpayer dollars they would simply turn their programs institutions or centers into privately owned establishments so they could continue to discriminate without interruption to protect their superiority and to preserve their privileged way of life now don't get me wrong black teachers were tolerated as long as they told the line as long as they followed the established curriculum and didn't try to get too fancy so too with a small number of well-to-do black doctors lawyers architects real estate brokers as long as they kept quiet in exchange for the chance to have their own child, uh, excuse me, in exchange for a chance to have their own child allowed a small piece of white opportunity, they gave their cooperation an unspoken promise not to cause any trouble or change. They made a silent agreement not to use their acquired skills to organize the unorganized and uneducated blacks. And through their silence, they would help keep the undesirables unaware, uninformed, and uninvited. The difference between myself and the suburban bred black kids was that I was not passive or content. I had not grown up soft, naive, and unsuspecting. My mother had not hidden me from the realities of life. To do so would have meant death. I understood that there was a difference between blacks and whites in America. I understood that there was a difference between good and evil. And I understood that there was a difference between being in control and being controlled. My goal was to gain control over my life so I would not have to be like any of any of the people I had ever met. I wanted to be in charge of my direction as opposed to simply reacting to whatever everyone else said and did and planned for me. Of course, like any child, I had my strengths and weaknesses. My strength was my relationship with God and my ability to think and pray, to be able to hear the sane inner voice inside my mind. I was soon discovered that this was a true blessing. So many people, young and old, had either ignored the spiritual voice inside themselves and listened instead to the fools that surrounded them, or they had responded to a voice that was not actually the voice of God inside of themselves and therefore had been misled down a path of self-destruction. All around me, I could see people casually destroying themselves by shooting drugs smoking crack selling sex drinking alcohol no longer could they hear the voice of their own coincidence of their own conscience my other strength was self-love this is a phrase that is largely overused but highly unachieved. In fact, if you ask any of the black people in the projects or the suburb if they love themselves, they will automatically say, of course, yeah, that's right, hell yeah. But people who love themselves do not allow themselves to be abused by others. I discovered at a very young age that neither black people in the projects nor in the suburbs truly love themselves because in varying degrees they were all co cooperative victims of abuse. I decided early on that I would not ever cooperate or suffer silently while being abused never would i allow anyone or group of people to dominate and trounce my spirit and soul this attitude and determination will follow me forever as for my weaknesses, I confess that observing my mother's relationships with men made me decide that I would simply not be bothered with the pain of male-female relationships. I had never seen the involvement pay off or settle with a happy ending. I had never seen the involvement uh, pay off or settle with a happy ending. There seemed to be short commercials of pleasure and long-running dramas and pain, tragedy, and confusion. So I took all the emotional boy-girl stuff away in the corner of my existence and became extremely involved in my education in the education of my mind, reading, writing, raising questions, and challenging thoughts. Sounds a lot like me. I also became extremely competitive, which can become an ugly and selfish trait. I felt I had to be the best in everything, whether it was an academic, athletic, creative, or artistic endeavor. I was also scarred by my New York experience. I had no belief in true friendship and would deny that it could exist. My father had taught me well. I guarded myself so well that I could cut off any person with whom I had been involved on any level if I thought they had turned against me or hurt me in even the slightest way. I would wake up the next morning, not even take breath, walk past the person, look them dead in the eye, not even blink or think twice. 
and act like I had never known them. In my mind and heart, my friends were only temporary acquaintances. As a result, people said that I was cold. As And it was true. I had few experiences with girls as friends or boys as boyfriends. If I was intellectually advanced, I was socially way behind. I didn't worry too much. I didn't worry about it too much since I saw very little good coming out of such friendships anyway. Girlfriends seemed jealous and backstabbing. Boys seemed mindless and one-dimensional and purely sex sexually driven. Parents seemed disconnected and uninterested. And the outside world racist and unconcerned about the hand it dealt to black people. By the time I was 15, I was an intellectual comedy at my strengths and weaknesses and adolescence all kicked in. I knew an older girl named Dana. She was having a serious relationship with a guy named Ronnie. Everybody in school knew about it. Me and Dana hung out because she was older and I had a habit of looking for a good conversation. One day, when I was at Dana's house, Ronnie stopped by with his younger brother, Jay. Now, Jay was the color of caramel with big, huge brown eyes that seemed to be filled with water, even though he wasn't crying. He had lips like comfortable pillows and a light mustache. He was thick with a nice physique. I was very attracted to him. I felt my whole body heat up when I looked at him. I watched him from the kitchen while he walked to Ronnie and Dana in the living room. As I listened, I noticed he had a little raspy voice like one of those masculine, like one of those old masculine masculine musicians but i didn't say anything or mention it to dana somehow she knew anyway maybe because i had asked several questions about him over the next two weeks and what i stupidly thought was a roundabout way Finally, Dana said that Ronnie and Jay wanted to take us out to the movies next Saturday. My inside said yes. My mind resisted. My emotions took over and I said yes, thinking it should be all right since there will be four of us in a public place. Saturday evening came and I told my mother I was going over to Dana's house. She said okay. We met up with Ronnie and Jay at the movies. Once inside the theater, Dana and Ronnie, as usual, were all over each other. But I was just meeting Jay. I felt hot, but I didn't feel like expressing it. My emotions and imagination were enough for me. Just looking at this brother and admiring his body was doing whatever I wanted to do with him and my mind was plenty. When the movie was over, Ronnie and Dana said we were going to Ronnie's house. I was horrified. I did not want to go. Dana took one look at my face and pulled me inside. She said, you have to come cover me. If I, if you get home early and I don't, I'll get in trouble. If I show up at Ronnie's house late, his mom would get suspicious and watch over us like a hawk. So I asked, where does Ronnie live? She said about two miles from my mother's. So I said, okay, I'll stay for a little while. When we got to Ronnie's house, his mother was drunk and had one of her boyfriends over. She was entertaining him in the living room. She gave us the evil eye and told Ronnie to take his company and go upstairs to his own room. Well, my heart dropped because I had made it a rule never to go in the bedroom of any guy and now I was being ordered to do so by someone else's parent. I wanted to go home, but I had no ride. I didn't want to leave or start an argument with Dana. I decided not to panic. I would do what I agreed on and make her keep her word to leave soon now we were all in the bedroom which ronnie and jay shared dana went and sat on ronnie's bed and jay just for me to go and sit on his nervously i sat ronnie closed the bedroom door for the better part of 10 minutes i listened to the sound of dana and ronnie's tongue sliding in and out of each other's mouths off came dana's coat then her top then her bra and standing erect with two firm medium-sized breasts Ronnie, now shirtless himself, was running his tongue over Dana's nipple, and she moaned in delight. He slipped his hand around the lamp and turned off the light. Meanwhile, I'm sitting on Jay's bed like a snowman. My body was tilted away from Dana and Ronnie's side of the room, but I could still see them out the corners of my eyes. Deep down inside, I wanted to see them because I had never seen anybody just do it right in front of my face. It turned me on and aroused my interest, but my guard itself was in control. My mother had always painted pregnancy as the end of the world for every woman and had even said that it was the reason why her own life had been ruined. Now Jay stood before me, inspired and gleaming eye, as though his high-powered stare could burn through my clothes. The only light in the room was the light sneaking in from the hallway outside the bedroom door. Jay broke the silence and whispered, stay here, I'll be right back, as if I had a choice. He quickly returned with his button-down shirt open and two, ar- and two arms filled with stuff. I saw him place a towel on top of his dresser. Then I heard some paper and plastic tan like a candy wrapper or something. The next thing I heard was the unscrewing of a top from a jar. It sounded familiar, and in two seconds I realized, sitting there in the dark, it was a jar of Vaseline. Terror shot through my whole body, and I stood up and zipped up my coat. What are you doing? I said. You know what I'm doing, Jay said evenly. What's that you're opening? Come on, you know what it is. Don't try to tell me some bullshit like you're a virgin or something. My eyes opened wide and indignant, and I said, I am. Yeah, right. I am. 
I looked toward Dana and Ronnie, who were bucking wildly all over the bed. It was obvious that I wasn't going to get her out of that sensual grip. My eyes shot back toward Jay. I was filled with fear. I hadn't escaped all that I had in my life to lose it like this. Seeing me panicking and breaking out in a sweat, sweat Jay said, All right, all right, just let me stick it in your ass then. I gasped for air, ran out the bedroom, down the stairs, through the screen door, and the entire two miles to my house. I came stumbling through my door, huffing and puffing. I told my mother what had happened and how shocked I was. She cracked up with laughter. This pissing me off. What? Your daughter just tell you that she could have possibly been in a potential rape situation or she was just somewhere with some boys doing what she um, felt like she shouldn't need to been doing and you just bust out laughing? The hell? Like many young hip mothers, mine made no big ordeal out of sex itself. There were really only two rules. One, don't do anything you don't want to do. And two, don't get pregnant. There was no instruction on how to meet a man, how to judge a man, test a man, love a man, or keep a man. There was no vision discussed or placed before a young daughter's eyes so as to what the end result was supposed to be. Was it marriage? Was it family? Was any of this important anyway? In my mother's house, pregnancy was just another word for doomed. And marriage was the same as failure. But sex was cool. Lord have mercy. I think I'm just going to stop there. No, I'll stop at the next part where it's actually an actual break. In school on Monday morning, everybody who found out was tripping on me. The guys were saying that I was a virgin and that I was lame. Lame mean that you didn't even give up kisses. Kids talked about how smart I was and how I probably read encyclopedias. A boy named Scooter, who was known to be real nasty and low down, said to me, You know, your ass is too big and your hips are too wide to keep all that good stuff to yourself. Now, I know your type. You waiting for some Prince Charming to come take you away into a place to live happily ever after. But let me tell you a little secret. There ain't no Prince Charming. When you think you met him, he'll break your heart. So why not let me get some pussy now and I'll teach you all you need to know why you're young so nobody will take advantage of you. I rolled my big brown eyes at him and sucked my teeth like a New York girl with attitude would. By the time I was 16 years old, I had seen at least 10 men come into my house in an attempt to have a relationship with my mother. Whether it ended in tears or smiles, the common denomination was that it ended. I began to see my mother not as the perfect angel that guarded me from danger and provided me with food, clothes, shelter, and survival lessons. Instead, I saw her as a young and confused woman with many imperfections who married young. Like many adults, she wanted her children to do as she said and not as she did. Like many adults, she didn't understand the power of her example. As time went on, the more I saw and felt the gap between her words and deeds, that gap hurt me. Worse was the loss of my respect. I continued to love my mother, but the loss of respect will alter the nature of our connection, our relationship, our spiritual bond. There were many examples. My mother had always taught me that drugs killed the mind and spirit and they should never destroy our body and that we should never destroy our body with drugs. Then one day while looking for typing paper, I found rolling paper and marijuana in her room. When I asked her about it, she said it was hers and so what? She shrugged her shoulders and said I was silly, oversensitive, and that reefer was no big thing. But I was dead set against any kind of drugs. I found that my friends who smoked reefer would always say it was a cool drug, but what they never seemed to notice was that it made them extremely lazy. They were tired and had a tendency to never complete their schoolwork. Plus, reefer almost always led them to try another drug for a higher high. Now, one day I came home and found my mother and sister fighting physically on the floor. When I broke it up and asked what was wrong, my mother blurted out, She stole my reefer. My sister yelled, it was mine because I bought a nickel bag yesterday. Each word they spoke was like a stab in my stomach. That fight would leave a permanent wound to my mind and heart. Afterward, I thought deeply about that day and grew more and more to understand how the day-to-day -day pressures of being black, penniless, structureless, culturally restricted, and frustrated in America could tear away at something that was supposed to be sacred, our loved ones, and our family. Then there was the confusion in the morals we were taught. For instance, my my brother was allowed to have young women go into and stay over in his bedroom. Neither my sisters nor I were allowed to do this. My mother said she didn't want us to get pregnant because our lives would be over. But why wasn't she concerned about anyone else's daughter getting pregnant? Then she realized that if every black mother was only worried about their particular daughter, that one day her daughter would be allowed to sleep over in the home of some other unconcerned parent. My brother was also encouraged to not get serious with 
any one specific woman. Even when he found one steady girlfriend, my mother urged him to be out exploring. I asked my mother why she would encourage the breakup of a one-on-one relationship. I also asked her if she saw any connection between the way she was raising my brother to behave and the behavior of the men who had broken her heart over the past 15 years. When I asked my mother these questions, she said that I took life too seriously. She told me that even some of the men I admired, the great black men of history, had a truckload of women. To me, that still did not justify encouraging the cycle, which seemed to end only with more fatherless children and even more vicious cycle. I tried to understand and balance my mother's words to me as a young woman. She cautioned me against wasting too much time on these men who were all the same. She repeated that pregnancy would ruin my life. She warned that marriage never works. Yet when I would wear a button-down blouse, she would tell me to unfasten the top three buttons. I resisted, saying I didn't want my breasts to show. She would say a little cleavage never hurt nobody. Loosen up. It's sexy. If I wore my skirts long, she would say, put a hem in that skirt. You have pretty legs. You should show them how. You should... You should show how them yeah it must be a typo on holidays my mother would insist that i take a drink to celebrate i'd always say no thanks i don't drink she'd say you need to learn to relax have a drink anyway usually i end up taking the glass and giving it to my brother or sister who are more than happy to have extra i couldn't understand why i should show cleavage be sexy and loosen up if i was not supposed to get pregnant i couldn't understand why i was okay to have sex if i shouldn't get married and i couldn't understand why i should drink alcohol if i did not want to and was raised by her to believe that drugs and alcohol would destroy me Interesting questions. Leading by example. Lord have mercy. I'm going to stop there because this still got like, actually, I ain't even got that many more pages. I should just finish it. Shoot. I'm going to just finish it. I done read this long. But the next chapters I'm going to do in, um, I'm going to do in, uh, separate because they long. The summer I turned 17, a terrible thing occurred. Excuse me. I was coming home from one of my two-month-long educational trips. By this time, I had won several trophies, awards, scholarships, tuition-free conferences based on my extracurricular activities, community work, academic achievement, and the skillful running of my mouth. I gained the opportunity to travel around the country, experiencing all kinds of educational events. These events were almost always for white youth, but by handling my guidance counselors, reading the newspapers every day, participating in the Board of Education meetings, and writing for the school newspaper, I found out all about of uh, the hidden benefits and made sure that they were available to me and known to other students in the school that summer i had gone to xx now I, oh she left the name out she said she changed the names of characters and certain events and stuff so she had gone to xx now i was on my way back home i flew into john f kennedy airport i went to the luggage carousel and picked up my heavy suitcases which were always filled with books because i could not afford clothes i went through the exit gate there were hundreds of people gathered waiting for their friends and relatives to come out my family was supposed to pick me up i heard a man calling my name i looked up and saw a white man he looked italian i didn't think he could possibly be talking to me i kept walking as I walked, he was coming toward me from the opposite direction and would place himself directly in my line of view again and call my name. I kept walking. Then I saw my brother. I smiled happily and headed toward him. As I walked toward my brother, the white man did too. Then he placed his hand on my brother's shoulder as though they were lifelong buddies and said hi to me, gesturing as if to help me with my luggage. I rolled my eyes at him and asked my brother, who is this guy? He laughed and said, this is my boss, Tony. He's going to give us a ride to the house. I skeptically said, okay, since my big brother was there. When we got to the house, I was happy to see my mother and family. I had been gone for the entire summer. There was a lot to tell. The people I met, liked and didn't like. The places I'd seen, the things I'd learned. My mother seemed genuinely happy for me, as though she was grateful in her heart that my life would be different than hers had been. While I was talking to my mother, brother, and sisters, the white guy was sitting on our couch looking rather comfortable, familiar, and relaxed as if he had no plans of leaving. After a while, he even had the nerve to try to involve himself in our family discussion. I turned around and said, who asked you anything? He said he was just commenting. I said, well, I look after my mother's interests. He got up from the couch and said, I am your mother's interest. The heat and anger began to rise up from my ankles to my neck. <clears throat> Excuse me. I searched the eyes of my brothers and sisters around the table. <coughs> <coughs> my sisters got up quickly, one by one. My mother slid into the kitchen. My brother refused to connect with my eyes as he turned to Tony and said, Come on, man. We got to finish the pipes at the Genesis Avenue address. Tony got up. 
and together they left. The next day, early in the morning, morning, Tony was back, ringing our bell. I opened the door and said as nasty as I could, what? I put my body in position to block his entry. He said, yeah, can you ask Peaches to come downstairs? I said, for what? He said, look, I interrupted. My brother works for you. Well, I'll get him. But as far as I know, my mother doesn't work for you. By this time, my mother was standing behind me in her robe. She said, I'll get it. I said, I got it. She said, move out the way. Instead of moving, I slammed the door in Tony's face, leaving him on the outside and me and my mother on the inside. She said, why are you so rude? I said, why is this white guy so bold? Who is he and what does he want with you? She said, he wants to talk to me. So I screamed, for what? She said, get out the way. I said, I hope you're not sleeping with him because you damn sure can't be sleeping with the devil. My mother said, calm down. People are people no matter what color they are. I said, yeah, only niggas say that. The whole world is arranged on color. The whites rule and the blacks are the rule no matter where you go, mommy. Don't tell me you think this asshole loves you because he doesn't. I can guarantee you that. Because they don't love mommy. They conquer and they possess. And I know these people, mommy. I deal with them every day. They want it all. They want everything. They want it all. They want total control. Control over your mind, your money, your body, your spirit, and eventually your soul. I deal with them, mommy, when I have to. When I have to but I'm smart enough to know who and what I'm dealing with. My mother rolled her eyes and lightly and said calmly, Men are men. Someday you'll learn that. You talk all this stuff about black this, black that. But where were all these great black men when my children were starving and needed a roof over their heads? They're there for fun, but not for responsibility. They don't have no money, no power. And even when they don't have money, they ain't. And even when they do have money, they ain't giving none of it to me. You were here left sitting in the dark because Con Ed turned off the gas and electric because of no money. I called Robert. Here he's supposed to do some big time ambassador to the United Nations. But I see all he said was, oh, that's a shame I gotta go. So we sat in the dark for almost two weeks damn near starving to death is that love where's your father where's tyrone joe bob dave ted reggie ralph and all the rest of the black men who supposedly love me the state of mind of all those black men mommy was created and controlled by these white people through their schools their laws their thievery their enslavement their value system their finance system and the evil way that they have dealt historically with our people the whites have almost completely conquered the black man. They've driven him homeless, landless, languageless, penniless, and damn near mindless. Daddy wanted to love you. Circumstance destroyed him. Tyrone loved you. Circumstance and the Vietnam War destroyed him. Even Big Joe wanted to love you, but white people kept him powerless for so long that when he became a cop, he couldn't even handle the position. As for the others, if a black man can barely finance himself in this world, how many of them do you think can take seriously the responsibility of financing you and four children? But there's one thing I know, Mommy, that white man out there does not love you. I promise you that. Love don't pay the rent, she said. Sex for money is prostitution, Mommy. She lowered her eyes and said, You don't know if I love him because when you look at him, all you see is white, and that immediately turns you against him. That's what you think. But I have a spirit, Mommy, and I can feel. I can see and I can listen even when no one is talking. I've seen you in love, and I know you do not love him. We'll talk about it later. I sucked my teeth and went straight to my brother's room. My brother was getting dressed. When he saw me, he looked as if to say he didn't want to be involved. But, of course, I pushed him anyway. So, how long have you been working for this plumber? About a month and a half, he said flatly. If you work for him, why does he always want to talk to mommy? I don't know nothing about that. All I do is fix the pipes and the pay is good. So what's up with him? Is he trying to do mommy? Look, the man has a wife and lots of children. He's from Ridgefield Park. He's an electrician and a plumber, and that's all I know about him. Do you think if a woman doesn't love a man, she sleeps with him for money, that is prostitution? I think you should stop trying to burst people's bubble. You always think it's your job to tell people the truth. You stick a mirror in their face. A lot of people don't want to see themselves. Don't you realize that the reality is too much for a whole lot of people to handle? As I stood there a moment to think about what he was saying to me, he left. Afterward, I thought about the black men who turned their heads during slavery as if they didn't know the white master was raping their wife, daughter, sister, and even mother. I tried to understand what it, <clears throat> what it was that gives the black man the capacity to say and do nothing while they are being so obviously violated. I tried to understand if pride was dead or if this was some new definition of strength that I didn't know about. <clears throat> or 
was it that the men who spoke up and did something were all killed by white people and I was left here on earth with only the cowards? Were they cowards or just survivors? I went to my room and I started to write a letter to my mother. I wrote how it was always she who had encouraged me to study, read, and learn. But now that I had done so, she seemed to have a problem with what I had discovered. I explained my objection to her relationship with Tony. I spoke of the effects of slavery and destroying the family structure of our people and of our native beliefs. I told her the difference between the oppressor and the oppressed, the master and the slave. I told her about a beautiful woman in history named Sally Hemmings I had once read a book about. She was the mistress of Thomas Jefferson. Even though she was se even though he was sexing her, she was still a slave, and so were the children he fathered for her and never officially claimed. I told her that white people get and take what they want all the time. They get what they can use out of it, then throw it to the curb, but that black people never got what we wanted out of the equation, that we still suffer from slave mentality. I tried to make her understand that, yes, black people did wicked things to each other, but everything in life taught us to hate ourselves and each other. <clears throat> That's why it was so easy for most black people to destroy one another. But who taught white people to hate black people? They taught black to hate black and still teach it. But who taught them to hate us? It could not have been us, I wrote, because most black people love and worship white people. I closed my letter with a proposal for a solution. Believing that financial pressure made my mommy see Tony, I proposed that my older brother, who was in college and had a job, take care of our middle sister. I would get a job and take care of my younger sister. That way, we would all put our money together and wouldn't need to be dependent upon any outside intruders or any men that she did not love. She read the letter, but she did not change. It was as though body snatchers had somehow invaded her body and turned her heart cold. Life was too much and too harsh for her. Tony would end up only one of more than a handful of white men that would invade our house. I had more than several clashes, one or two of them nearing violence with all of them my mother described her personality change as being the year she would become a real lady when i asked her what she meant she said i have a man with some money and some power i'll get my nails manicured and my feet pedicured i always use exquisite manners meet all the right people be in all the right places she told me she was going to be a model or an actress that she had the talent plus she was finally going to make her beauty pay off to me it seemed she was trying to solve her problem by turning white Still, I thank God in my prayers for my mother, who I had known, loved, and respected for 16 years. I thank God that she had the strength to give us and secure, to save us and secure us from the projects, the danger, the hunger, and the mental devastation. I thank God she had the intelligence to teach us to be drug-free, compassionate, level-headed, and in control. I thank God for allowing me to know her before the world took her because some kids don't even get 16 good years with their mothers. Then I mark down the end of 16 years as the year my mother dies because the woman walking around the house posing as my mother was not my mother. She was America's creation and that did not belong to me. All right, y'all, that's the end of chapter one, Mother. That was really, 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 really good. She spoke on a lot of really good things that affect us as black society to this day. Um, I really love how she broke down living in the projects, the mental devastation, the financial situations, the single parenting. And it just seemed like that's all they had time to do was do drugs and have sex and make babies. And then send them to the um, school system where they're taught by white teachers, put in special ed classrooms, or they're around... Um, um, a mix of students and they're getting all white information in the school still very relevant what's going on today so i really love this book um and i'm going to upload it on my youtube page and i'm probably going to read the different chapters in um increments since the chapters are so long but i appreciate those of you that tuned in and i hope you learned something new i love this book so much no disrespect my sister soldier check it out all right peace love and light y'all